So welcome to Editing in an E-World. Uh, I'm Kay Warnock and I'm your host. Traditionally, many of us have used colored pens to keep track of who made edits or the point at which an edit was made. Um, and we've also relied on the tandem reading, um, tandem proofreading. Um, but 2020 has been the year of change. Um, it has affected our ability to use many of the practices that we have relied on for decades to draft, to collaborate, and to edit. Many of us are working from home or in socially distanced environments in our offices. Sometimes we see the remote work setting as a communication barrier. We can't walk over to a colleague's desk. Well, we can't ask their opinion, you know, lean into in the door and say, what do you think of this? Um, obviously the tools are still there, um, the phone, email, online chats and video calls, but those are not really familiar to us. Um, the bonding we used to enjoy over a cup of coffee or a quick chat in the hall is gone. Uh, so we have to find new ways to connect with one another. Um, but there are ways that we can help our, our teams to feel more connected. Um, I'm a member of the Legislative Staff Services Program at NCSL. And once a week, I lead our department check-in meeting. When we shifted to remote work, I started adding um, short icebreakers and team builders to our regular video call. Um, icebreakers can be simple questions. What's your favorite movie? Favorite season? Or it can be a quick exercise. Um, they may seem silly, but it helps us to feel connected as human beings. Um, and so we feel they're important for our team. So what we're gonna do now is a quick icebreaker. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna put you in small rooms where you can chat about the top topic that I present to you. The person who has the first name closest to the letter Z um, is going to be your group reporter. Um, and that person needs to keep track of who, uh, or not who, but of what the ideas are that are shared. You don't have to keep track of all of them, but a handful of them so that everyone um, knows what they are. Uh, that gives us a chance to share information. So here is your task, everyone. Name one beneficial thing you or your team has learned now that much of your work is remote. All right, everyone is coming back. So those of you who were uh, reporters in your group, group reporters, if you would please post in the chat um, some of the information that you learned in your discussions, that would be great. That helps to share information with everyone. And I am looking for my faculty. Here comes Carrie. And Fred. And Lily. And I'm looking for Wendy. There she is. Okay, my team is back. Yay. All right. So if any of you would like a list of icebreakers that you can use with your teams at some point in the future, please let me know and I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, but I do find in our office that it's a way for us to connect in another way. Um, and so some of the folks are starting to post some things in the chat. Uh, so uh, Mariah tells us that they talked about not being in the office has made them appreciate their coworkers and that they um, feel they've tried to grow closer during the distance. Yeah, I think a lot of us are feeling that way that that we we miss those people that we that we had that chance to connect with and 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 share ideas. Um, Erica says that um, that we can change when forced to do so. Yeah, that's that's true. It does sort of feel like we're being forced, um, but it but it's something that's so valuable for us to learn to do. Learning to adapt. Um, that's something that we as humans are, are good at as, as long as we allow ourselves to and don't get stuck in, in um, a particular mindset. Um, that there, uh, Carrie tells us that there's a need for analog feedback. Yeah, you're right. And remote work can um, work for interim workload. Um, and that there are uh, beneficial 
thing, there are beneficial things about remote work, but it also uh, doesn't work very well during session. That's very true. Um, so there are lots of other ideas here. Actually, one of the things I'll do is I will type these up and share them with all of you uh, later on in the week. Um, so let's get started. Um, we've assembled a panel um, with very diverse roles. Um, they work on reports, they draft bills, um, they, um, they edit bills, they edit these reports um, and other many other types of legislative materials. Um, our team today is Lily Hausenfluch. She is the chief editor for the Virginia Division of Legislative Services. Wendy Jackson, who is administrative services manager with the Wisconsin Legislative Reference Bureau. Carrie Eskridge is Deputy Division Director with the Texas Legislative Council. And Fred Messer is Principal Deputy Legislative Council with California's Legislative Council. So welcome team. Um, I'm gonna start um, asking some questions of our um, panel and they're going to answer their th questions. If any of you have comments on those things or additional questions, please post those in the chat. And as we have time, we'll start to include you in the discussion. Okay, so panel, here's your first question. How long have you worked for your legislature and how big is your team? Lily, can we start with you? Yes, that sounds fine. I've been an editor with the Virginia Division of Legislative Services, uh, which is the agency that provides uh, nonpartisan bill and resolution draft and committee staffing among other legal services uh, for 23 years. Um, and the last 11 of those has been as chief editor. Uh, we have three year round permanent people. Um, we're lean and we're efficient. <laughs> and then we hire three additional people uh, as seasonal editors who work with us from November through March. Um, our seasonal editor job used to be six weeks and now it's five months. So it, part of that is a, a, a testament to um, increased bill requesting in Virginia. I'm sure you have that too. Um, uh, so right now we are training these seasonal proofers and we have six in our in our office. Great, thank you. How about you, Wendy? Sure, thank you, Kay. Hi, I'm Wendy. I work for the nonpartisan bill drafting office in Wisconsin. We're the Wisconsin Legislative Reference Bureau, and I'm the administrative services manager, which means that I supervise the work of our program assistants and our editors and one visual designer. Um, I also do a lot of editing myself because that is my true love. Um, and we have 10 editors right now, um, and that might seem like a bigger editing pool, but not only are we editing bill drafts and legislative proposals, but also we're editing research publications and legal memos and research memos. Um, so we're, we're learning a lot and doing a lot. And did I say I've been here for a little over 20 years. I tried to leave the legislature uh, in the early 2000s and I moved to South Korea and um, I taught English for a year and then I found myself right back here for another 20 years almost. So you can try to leave, good luck. Thank you, Wendy. Carrie, how about you? Hello, I'm Kerry Eskridge. I work for the Texas Legislative Council. Our agency, much like the others, uh, supports the legislature with bill drafting, technical support, and I work in the research division that does uh, policy research and redistricting support, as well as drafts memorial and congratulatory resolutions, joint resolutions and, and policy resolutions. The group that I work most closely with is responsible for bill analyses and some other comparative analyses that come at the end of the, of the session, the conference committee report uh, process. Uh, and our group has about 16 researchers, uh, which do some drafting of those and review of those. And we have our own uh, research editing group as well that does the resolutions and the bill analyses. So there's 16 researchers uh, there's six uh, permanent or regular staff uh, editors. Uh, and we have three incoming researchers too. We just finished our hiring process. They begin on December 1st, uh, going into our session in January. Uh, and I've worked at the agency for 24 years. Super, thank you. Fred, how about you? Hi everyone, Fred Messer, I'm from uh, California again. I've been uh, practicing law for 25 years and I've been a legislative lawyer for 15 of those years. 
Uh, I manage a team of uh, 20 uh, legislative bill drafting attorneys. Uh, I guess 21 if I'm on the team, <laughs> but uh, uh, we cover a bright, wide range of subjects. Uh, we Our two biggest ones are both a criminal law and healthcare. So 2020 has been a real boon for our business and I'm uh, happy to be here. Thank you. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, panel, can you describe your transition from working in the office to telecommuting? Lily, let's start with you again. Um, so, uh as with all of us, it was sudden uh, and it appeared to be temporary. We thought maybe two weeks, maybe a month. Uh, we already had a pretty um, electronic uh, good editing process. Um, we um, had edited um, uh, electronically at night and on the weekends um, during some of our um, busiest times. Um, but our 2020 session had just adjourned on uh, March 12th. And then our governor's stay at home order was on March 13th. So it was quite the transition. Uh, we also had um, a number of post-session processes that were 100% paper. Um, we were totally unprepared for how we were gonna handle those um, to do a um, process for all the bills that passed. And there were 1,300 of them this year. And we had only done 800 at that point. So we had these additional bills to do. We had to scrambled to create Google Sheets and we came up with forms and reports and all kinds of ways we could communicate with each other uh, to get those post um, session um, processes done. Um, now we're looking at our systems uh, to accommodate being home through March. Um, and, and we've been doing our hiring and uh, training of our seasonal proofers, uh, seasonal editors uh, remotely. Wendy? I would echo some of what Lily described, and I would describe our transition from being in the office to working from home as fast and furious. Um, and we didn't know it at the time, but we were also heading into an extraordinary session in April. Um, but between March 13 and March 18, we went from never having done our heavily, our paper heavy jobs anywhere except for in our offices with access to several printers to performing our jobs entirely from home and without paper. Um, over the course of those few days, we equipped ourselves to work from home. Editors were madly grabbing drafting manuals and any blue book that we have. If you happen to have a Chicago manual style, people are grabbing those. Um, we also figured out how to purchase online subscriptions to those resources, so like Chicago, Merriam-Webster, and the Blue Book Citation Guide. Um, we programmed our laptops to access our remote desktops. We set up a Skype room for immediate communication among editors, um, and we started relying on that very heavily right away, and we now call that the Hive. Um, now, since we've established the Hive, our whole agency has moved from Skype, which does have some limitations, to a communication platform called Slack. Um, and so on Slack, the editors have a private channel that we also call The Hive. Uh, we all signed telecommuting agreements. We forwarded our office phones to our cell phones. Um, and then we also got computer permissions to submit drafts to requesters. In the past, only I and the program assistants could do that. And we realized really quickly that the entire editing pool is going to need to have um, permissions so that we could be as responsive as possible. With that um, came some ironing out with communication. Um, and I looked at my emails between March 13 and March 18, and the emails were just flying. And the messaging changed really quickly from, I don't know how we are going to do this, to this is what we're going to do in eight steps. And those eight steps are still basically what we're doing, but over the summertime um, and early fall, we've been able to polish that process. And I would like to say that I think we're um, more efficient than ever without losing quality. Thank you. Carrie. So I'm something of an outlier. I'm probably in between uh, Fred and Lily here, but um, my group had transitioned to a fully digital production process about eight years ago. So 
transitioning to remote work, that was somewhat seamless. We kind of did the same things as we've always done, but um, as kind of came out in the icebreaker earlier, um, certainly we didn't realize how much we relied on that in-person communication and kind of the, the happenstance of walking down the hall and what kind of feedback uh, we might get face to face. Um, so that has been something of a transition for us. We also heavily uh, use Slack. Our entire agency is on Slack, in fact, um, and that has been one way that we've been able to accommodate um, that communication. Um, but as far as our tools and the production process, we already had most of that in place. And so that part of the, the process um, wasn't extremely difficult for us. Thanks. Fred? Well, we went on the uh, kind of software side and implementation side, it was fantastic. Um, our IT staff had always planned on converting us to remote access early on. So we had all the tools there. On the personnel side, it was a bit of uh, chaos, I would say, uh, that uh, my drafting team didn't have remote access before. And so it was brand new for them. About a third of my team didn't have a home PC or Mac that would handle our remote access capabilities. So, but, uh, you know, people didn't want to just be sitting on the sidelines during COVID. So I had people running out to Costco and Best Buy and buying just a new machine so they could participate. Uh, we didn't have enough office laptops to go around to everyone. We have about 80 plus attorneys. We have about 50 editors and uh, typists, and then we have HR staff and we just didn't have enough to go around. And, uh, but I would say that, you know, we were all connected to our PCs within 24 hours. And so that was uh, pretty good for the size of our uh, office staff. And we were probably running full speed about uh, two, three weeks into it. California has a full-time legislative session. So we go from January to August every year. So uh, we got online, I think we went home March 17th, March 18th, and it was pretty seamless for the rest of the session. So that was a big success. Thanks. All right, panel, here's your next question. What challenges have you encountered and what innovations have you discovered along the way? So for, for us, um, equipment was a challenge. It's interesting that that has come up. Um, we all had laptops and we were working from home with laptops and some of us were connecting them to monitors and using keyboards at home. And we had it set up so we could go back and forth. I could just bring my monitor, my uh, laptop home and I would connected to my monitor and I worked at home, then I would take it back and dock it at, at, at work. Um, now, uh, in order to uh, accommodate two, two monitors for every editor, which is what we have, um, we had to bring our docs home. So we can't, there's no seamlessness to going back right now. We have to be 100% at home. Uh, but we all have two monitors now. Um, and, it, and if you needed a printer, you could bring home a printer. Um, because we had our laptops and they were set up in the way they were for electronic use. Uh, we also, as um, Wendy uh, had in her situation, we had a special session that was dealing with COVID and police reform. And that started on August 18th and did not finish until a week ago Monday. And it was daily. It was not one of those special sessions that, you know, we all have that are, you know, they come in one day and they have some meetings and then they come back in two weeks and everything's good. This was every day. And so we had a year round session. It has been chaos in that regard. Um, but because we had all these electronic systems set up for editing, uh, we were good. Um, we did have some uh, IT issues. I saw uh, Wendy's chat about thank goodness for the IT people. Uh, so they've been able to remote in and fix problems. Um, our VPN system um, has worked I think remarkably well, considering how many people are on it now who were not um, on it before. Um, I guess um, uh, the other thing we did was use um, uh, Google Sheets more than we had before, and now and we're we are a Google Business Enterprise um, email, so we have access um, to Google Meet and now Google Chat, which is called Hangouts. And there's also some kind of thing called Google Groups that has threads. We're getting ready to try that out. Um, so we're, we're definitely reaching out to um, accommodate ways to communicate both within editing and then also within the, the larger division staff. Wendy. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, speaking to Lily's comment about using two screens, until now, I have never understood why anyone would want to do that or could do it. And I've, in fact, been in Lily's office, like several, it's been several years now, but I saw her working on these two screens and I didn't get it, but I get it now. Um, and some people have asked for that and have gotten it. Um, in terms of our, we've had lots of challenges like everyone else, but I would say our three major challenges were how to shift from editing without marking up paper and using red pens to editing on the screen. And that is where the two screens would come in handy. Um, how to communicate suggested edits to the, our drafters and authors. Um, in the past, we had always shown our authors and drafters any suggested edits with the paper file. And we might add a nicely typed up paper memo um, on which the attorney could reply using a pencil. Um, so that was another challenge. And then something we're still working on, um, but how to ensure quality with tandem proofreading. Um, and using that Slack now is helping because you can hop on a call and um, without planning, without scheduling a Zoom room. Um, um, as for innovations, we've discovered, and I'm going to uh, confide in you all, I had never thought about the fact that countless editors around the world do their jobs virtually and without paper. Like we are so heavy into paper. And suddenly I thought, I wonder if there are established protocols. And sure enough, um, and you know how I love to mention the Chicago Manual of Style whenever I talk to any of you, um, for those of you who do use that style guide, there is a whole, there's guidance in section 2.133 um, in Chicago about proofreading tools for PDF. And lo and behold, marking up a PDF is a lot like marking up a piece of paper. Um, in fact, it can be streamlined. Um, and there are advantages to editing online. Um, you can search text, you can search comments, you can type your annotations directly onto the page instead of having our separate memo with suggested edits. So it's a lot more um, efficient. Um, and then the other thing I would say in terms of an innovation is that um, we have always had a cutting edge bill drafting system. Um, we have a lot of tools and we're using our compare routine in a new way. And that is to be able to see what needs to be edited in new versions of drafts. Um, so we have this sophisticated routine and we used to use it to compare drafts to other drafts to see differences. And it's not unlike um, using the compare routine in Word, for example, um, but we can also use it to compare um, statutory text to our current statutes to make sure we're working with um, the current version of the statutes. But now we're using compare to compare two different versions of the same draft. And in this way, um, we can, the drafters can type directly into the new iteration of the draft and we can export the original version, check out the new version, compare those two documents and see what needs to be edited. Um, and a silver lining has been that in the past, the editors would type in all of the markup from the attorneys on new drafts and then edit that um, and um, get um, sign off on changes and then type some more and proofread. Um, so we're not having to type so much into the drafts and that's been a great innovation for us. Carrie. So I'm gonna answer this in two parts. And the first, I think we'll go back to our initial adoption of digital production because that's when some of these um, growing pains, you know, we first confronted some of these growing pains. Um, and it was an emergent situation then as well. Our agency was asked to undertake bill analysis um, at the end of a summer, beginning of a fall before a session. And that meant having to come up with uh, we, we basically had no idea what we were doing. So we had to come up with all of the processes um, at the last minute. And our other uh, support divisions within the agency just couldn't be taxed with an additional 20,000 documents uh, at such a late stage. So um, we kind of had to create our own uh, mini production process within the agency. Um, and that resulted in us having to abandon pencils, which um, was very difficult for me personally. Uh, and having to come up with these protocols for, you know, doing things paperless. 
Um, I think the two innovation, that was a pain point, to be honest, that the having to, or abandoning the pencils because it meant that you were, or it felt like you were abandoning the, the review process. If you didn't see the colors and you didn't understand whose expertise was impacting the document, it took us uh, at least a session to kind of get over that um, hurdle. But what, uh, how we innovated there was coming up with protocols for using Word very robustly, um, having templated work that helped us uh, become as efficient as we possibly could. Uh, we already had a very sophisticated tracking system, but we developed an online tracking, uh, uh, HTML-based tracking system, which was a little bit more intuitive um, and it was easier to use. Um, and that meant that we weren't having to, you know, hunt down paper copies uh, to answer questions and that sort of thing. Um, and then we also developed a, uh, a statute tool that helped us take a bill draft and seek out the statutes that were within being amended by the bill and those that were in the surrounding uh, statutes as well, which made our work uh, a lot more efficient. And that's since been adopted by our legal division um, and some other uh, support agencies actually and, and around the, the legislature. So on the flip side of that, the, the most recent circumstance, um, and you may be experiencing this right now with my connection, but we've had issues with uh, unstable and various variable connections. That's kind of been a big stumbling block. You know, some people's internet service is much better. We have a few people who actually live um, in rural, rural areas outside of the, the city. So those connections are, of course, um, difficult. Uh, and then we did have some equipment issues. I didn't realize how dependent I had become on my workstation at home. Um, I've had to take over a part of my garage to um, replicate that. Um, and so, uh, but I, yes, the, having the large screen so I could see multiple things on the screen at one time um, and just using a mouse. We, in the initial stages, I was using a laptop only. Um, and of course the screen was small and the, the, the mouse pad just didn't do it for me. So I think we've had to adapt to some of those uh, things, trying to figure out how to um, work within the confines of our personal space at home and make that as, as workable for us. Thanks, Carrie. Um, your audio is great, so not a problem at all. Fred, how about you? Well, we had the reverse side of the coin from Wendy's situation to having my uh, drafting attorneys communicate with the editors we had. Uh, our physical setup back in the office was that uh, we're embedded with our uh, quality assurance team, the, the, those editors who do the bulk of the proofing work. So in, when we we're in the office, a lot of it was, you know, we're also a pen and pencil organization. So it's just face-to-face -face communication, seeing the proofers marks on the documents, uh, getting that kind of personal feedback on requests. And so uh, trying to mimic that in a virtual environment was uh, pretty difficult. You know, our uh, work PCs don't have cameras. So any kind of a virtual environment we can't do Zoom connecting to our work PCs. It has to be in your like home environment and everything else. Uh, I would say for successes on uh, meeting that challenge, our uh, editors came up with, they started using the, the comments in Adobe that they can go in and uh, select a part of the sentence and they put a comment so yeah, I think we should strike out the the and put a that or put a comma. And then it gives a feedback bubble for the attorneys to go in and say, I agree, I disagree. And then all that comes to me when I'm approving all the jobs. So it works seamlessly and, you know, give them uh, all our editors great credit for uh, finding that never knew you could do it. And uh, it's been amazing. It's really helped us out a lot. Wonderful. Thank you, Fred. All right, let's move on to our next um, discussion. We're going to talk about electronic editing because obviously that's what we're all dealing with here. So here's your question. What electronic editing tools have you implemented or used in a new way? Lily. Thank you. Um, so most of our editing was already done electronically in a, a proprietary system um, that <clears throat> used Word. And I love Carrie's use of the word robust. Um, our uh, tech people are hate Word and they've been trying to get us out of it. And I keep telling them, if you can find something that does line numbers and track changes, as efficiently and effectively as Word, then go right ahead. Otherwise, we're sticking with Word. Um, we, uh, we have a system where our, our members of the General Assembly uh, make an electronic request. It goes immediately into our bill drafting system. 
Um, a request is assigned by a manager to a drafter, a drafter drafts, and then it comes to us um, in the form of draft completed. And um, Kay has asked me to show you just a little bit of what this looks like. Um, so I'm gonna try to use share screen, here we go. Okay, so this is what our bill drafting system looks like. I pulled up a screen from 2019 and I made sure it was a bill that got introduced. So there's nothing confidential um, in any of the screenshots. Um, so we work from an editor's view that's specifically for us that lets us um, uh, apply the names of um, our proofers and our editors. And then when we come to a, um, a, dra a, a bill request that we're gonna draft, an LD, a legislative draft, we open it up and this is, this is what we call our shuck. And that's because 25 years ago when we were completely paper, um, all of the information about a request came in one of those manila envelopes that's kind of a folder. You put things in and it was called a shuck. And so now this is the electronic shuck and it, it may always forever be a shuck. I don't know. Um, so uh, from here we can, um, they are able to attach a draft and a summary that we can read. Uh, there's lots of information that's um, applied, like um, who has requested it and, um, and introduced it, what committee it's gone to. Um, and then um, here we have the status is introduced. Usually what we get um, is draft completed. We move it to proofer assigned. And then one of our first readers takes it. Um, our new people are usually our first readers. We do two reads on every draft. Um, uh, our process um, moves through, so we have dates on when everything is happening. Um, the more interesting part, though, is um, so this is um, what a draft looks like, and it looks like Word. It acts like Word. Our IT people tell us it's really not exactly Word. Um, this is an HTM format of it, as you can um, see up here by the name. And uh, what happens is by using track changes we can see um, exactly who has done um, anything um, with track changes on. And so if um, by me marking that, I can look at it and I can tell exactly when it got done. We have a comment system so that if editors need to explain what we did or tell them they need a grammar fix or whatever kind of process um, happens with that, um, uh, word comments did not work in our system so we piggybacked on hyperlinks. So technically, this is a hyperlink. So it shows the text that I marked. And then my comment is, this is a sample comment. And we can get up to um, 170 characters because that's how many characters are limited with a It's very interesting. Um, but as you can see, we can do all of our uh, strike and add um, efficiently. And when we're done, we um, we save the we save the draft and and move on to um, the summary, which we also can use track changes in. And um, both these documents again are attached to the um, uh, shuck the electronic shuck. And then we also have um, a dot compare program um, that lets us uh, compare it to anything in the legislative information system. Um, whether it's been introduced or not. Um, we can also compare it to other legislative drafts. And uh, we do have a current code check that we can um, implement and we can compare the documents. And then what this shows us is what the differences are. So we have to, we look to see if, okay, anything that was stricken is still over here and anything that's new is not there. And we use that on all of our past bills at the end. And then we also use it when we're comparing a substitute to a, um, a current draft so that as mentioned, as Wendy mentioned, we know exactly what has been changed and it saves a lot of time in that regard. Um, we had this uh, in place um, about two years ago, but it's improved um, with work over, the, um, over those years. And I don't know really how we would have done all of this without this fully electronic um, system. So I am so impressed with anybody who could go from paper to, to some kind of form of electronic editing in as fast a fast pace of a world um, as, we, as we live in. So congratulations to all of you who have been able to do that. Even this, this small amount of 
uh, paper product, uh, paper processes that we did was amazingly challenging. Um, and um, so welcome to the e-world. Now I have to see if I can get out of this. Here we go. Thank you, Lily. Wendy. Hi, I just had to click my mute button. Um, my boss just now stopped by to say hi, so I just um, waved at him. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna also share my screen and first I'm gonna show you what our drafting file used to look like. Um, so I found an introduced file again, like Lily had said, um, from the 2017 session. I'm just gonna um, show you what the file used to look like. Um, so this is our request sheet, which we still use, um, but we are not printing them anymore. And it used to be that our drafting files were full of these request sheets for each and every iteration of a bill. Um, we would have our names printed on here, um, the program assistant, all kinds of information we used to collect. And over this process, we've kind of been wondering, um, like, why are we, why are we doing this? Um, the file um, that is available to the public also includes any drafting instructions. And then here is what our bill um, looks like. Um, and then an example of some markup on the paper. Um, and one thing that has really changed now, th this markup used to go into the drafting file. And um, we have realized that we do not need to include this markup in the drafting file. In fact, I've heard anecdotally that um, some folks who would um, review drafting files, when they were wondering if this markup came from lobbyists. And we're like, no, um, the editors are just um, performing quality control. So this is what it looked like. And then um, the editor, after getting sign off from the attorney, would go ahead and transfer all of these changes that you see. So Wendy, to... we're not seeing the changes. Can you share that screen? Oh yeah, I am actually. Can you see anything like, can you see that? Um, we're seeing your table of contents in your in your drive. So I'm oh. share that and share the other one. Well, that's a fail. So I'm gonna stop sharing that. Um, and then, well, what I just showed you was a copy of a heavily marked up bill. <laughs> Um, let me try um, to show what we're doing now, which is something that Fred touched on and hope this will work. Um, can you see that? Nope, you're back in the same drive. Huh, I wonder why. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna do my best to describe this so you're not like looking at my drive and that's too bad, um, but um, what we are now doing and what um, Fred shared and touched on that they're already doing is using the comments tool in a PDF file to mark up the document to show suggested edits to um, the attorney. We had already been doing some of this with our research publications um, because striking and scoring, which is how we show changes to current law, is not an issue when you're dealing with a research publication. Um, and I think this is why, because of the striking and scoring issue, this is why um, we couldn't, um, or we're a little weary or leery about moving to online editing. Um, so again, I heard someone else say, we're kind of forced to do this, forced into it. Um, also, I will say if there are any SCANI editors in this meeting, feel free to chime in where I miss things in the chat. Um, I can, I could use your support. <clears throat> um, so um, in the PDF, you can open up the comments tool, which gives you access to two things. One is it's going to open up a list on the right hand side of the page. Um, and that is a list of any edit you make on the page. So for any, anytime you use one of the um, the comments tools to mark up the page, you will see a corresponding item in the list along the side. And this is very nice um, for the person who has to implement those changes ultimately, because you can systematically click through the list of changes that um, need to be made. So included in the comments tool are tools for 
um, insertion points. Um, the tool I used most often is the highlighting. And again, that is because on a build draft, I can't use the strike tool or the score tool because that will confuse um, if I'm working on with amended text. Um, I could probably use it for created text because it's not an issue. Um, but I just have, um, as I've been learning how to do this these last few months, I've, it just hasn't been part of um, my repertoire, say. Um, so I, you, as Fred said, you can highlight any words within a PDF and then a corresponding comment will pop up and I can query the author. Did you mean to spell this this way? Or do you wanna use this word instead of this word? Because that's the change you've been making throughout the document. Um, so the highlight tool is really helpful. The other tool that is just like marking up um, a paper copy, although is the red pen tool. And I will say I have pretty good penmanship and I have a really hard time doing it on the screen. And another editor just got a hold of a stylus and she's telling us all, you guys need to get styluses because um, it makes for a much better markup. Um, but again, this markup now is, it is an internal document. It always really was, um, but we're not showing our markup to anyone and it's just, um, we want to have a neat markup for the attorney's sake so the attorney doesn't need to spend a whole bunch of time figuring out what we're trying to, to do. Um, but also for the editor who is making all these changes, transferring the changes from the PDF file over to our bill drafting system file. Um, so I talked about insertion and highlighting. Um, there's also a tool where you can replace text and this is helpful for our plain language analysis that comes at the beginning of a bill. Um, again, we probably could use striking and scoring and the replace text tool, um, as you'll see, um, if you ever experiment with this or those of you who use it, it does strike out the language and then scores in or uh, creates a comment for um, suggested replaced text. Um, let's see, there's also a sticky note tool that you can put in any margin um, to point something out to the author or drafter. Um, there's also, I wanted to show you, I'm disappointed I can't show you. Um, there, you can access proofreaders tools and they are adapted from Chicago's proofreading marks and they look so fun, but I found that for efficiency, you can't easily use them. It's like a two-step process. You have to highlight what, where you want to insert an M dash, my favorite piece of punctuation or one of top five, I'd say, um, and then also stick that in the margin. And in some ways that does look more like um, old school manuscript editing where you would um, use the proofreading symbols in the text and then do your annotation in the margin. And in that way too, I guess, um, the doing e-editing on PDF files um, mimics that a little more closely than what we were doing. Um, and I wanted to mention too that, and this, um, this comes from Chicago Manual Styles guidance on editing PDFs, but as on paper, any markup that we do in the PDF will overlay the text. And that's really important for editors to not obscure text that is coming from your author or your attorney. Um, so that's just the same. Um, it's the same protocol that we followed with paper. Um, also, as with editing on paper, it's in, important to avoid redundant markup. And I just talked about that, why I can't use those really um, great proofreaders marks in an efficient way. Um, all of the annotations should be apparent on the page. And again, that list is so nice to be able to systematically click through. And so no change is left um, missed. Um, and then the editor who's responsible for making the changes can use that um, the list in proofreading to make sure that everything um, was incorporated. And again, I talked, um, I mentioned that we used to religiously do tandem proofreading out loud. And we haven't done that as much and we're still working on how to use Slack to do that um, in, uh, more um, religiously, I guess. Um, and I haven't seen that we've lost a lot of quality, but when, as we head into session now and things get fast and furious, again, um, that's something that's been on my mind. So I can let you all know how we do with that. Um, and since I couldn't share my screen, what I can do is share with Kay, I have a guide for, um, a quick guide for marking up a PDF. So I'll share that with Kay right now and email it and then she can share it with everyone else. Thank you, Wendy. Carrie. 
Okay, I'll try not to be redundant of, um, of Lily and Wendy or step on Fred's toes here, but I will also share my screen and I'll show a couple of, of different things. Um, and then I'll speak to a third, which I don't have a, a bunch of uh, experience with myself actually, but, but that's because um, I'm in a different, different group. So let's try this and see if this works. This is our tracking system. Um, and it's probably the biggest innovation in terms of helping us go to digital. Um, we are actually rolling this out for our entire agency. Uh, our division was kind of an early adopter. As I said, it was just out of necessity because we um, you know, took on the responsibility of bill analysis uh, unexpectedly. Uh, and we can kind of get into a record here and I can just run you through very quickly what something looks like. These are all delivered. So again, no confidentiality issues, but how we, um, how we overcame some of the uh, issues that Wendy was just talking about, in fact, in terms of obscuring a, a predecessor's work on a document was by coming up with naming conventions for the documents. So they're saved in multiple iterations. This one actually doesn't have as many uh, in the record as, as you might expect, but um, when they are saved, each person's work is preserved and then it moves to the next person in line. They do their work and it's saved. For our review documents, you can actually see uh, everyone's work. It's all in Word and it's all using track changes. So when you hover above um, you know, someone's uh, insertion or deletion, you'll see who was responsible for that. Um, I'll show you very quickly. Doc Oops, sorry about that. Here's a, a document, kind of a working document that we have. And you'll see, we also use uh, comments quite a bit. Um, in some cases, we'll, uh, we'll let go of the formatting so that doesn't obscure some of the more, uh, you know, important stuff that's going on in the comments. We actually roadmap all of our work. Now, this is obviously a little bit different than a build draft. So we're not, um, we're not hampered by the underscoring and the bracketing like you might be in, in working with build drafts. But uh, this is all original content, but um, we roadmap all of our uh, analyses according to the bill sections that uh, we're actually uh, describing. And it's kind of like what Wendy was talking about precedes their bill drafts. And I years ago did a presentation with one of the attorneys from Wisconsin, and th these are very similar documents to what is in the bill file there. Um, and you'll just see that we will talk back and forth with each other about things. Now, our editors. We, we actually- So Carrie, we're still seeing the original screen. Oh, you are. Well, dang. So we unshare <laughs> and try sharing. Okay, I'll try again. I'm sorry. Let's see if we can. Are you seeing this, this file now? Yes, perfect. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I must have shared just one screen, so. Um, anyway, you'll see that we, we use the comments, uh, we speak to our editors directly through those comments and, and any, uh, you know, uh, legacy conversation that might have occurred between the drafters and the reviewers goes into comments. Uh, we use them rather robustly. We have a tool um, that strips out all of that so that all it leaves is the roadmap where uh, each of these um, kind of descriptions for the relevant bill section, uh, those remain in the document when we deliver them to our clients. Um, but you can see all of the changes that go into a document and, and how the comments um, help there. I'm going to, let me stop sharing again and go back to a different thing since I don't think I'm sharing properly, but let me, let me do it this way. And I wanna show you, um, and again, this is our this is our tracking system. Probably one of our bigger innovations on our end uh, has been this tool, which is takes a bill draft and breaks down all of the statutes within the bill draft and the surrounding statutes as well. So, you know, when we're analyzing a bill, we can very quickly navigate through the draft. Um, we get to the parts that we need to see for our analysis. We have a tree that is the bill on one side, and then we actually have access to a statute tree on the other side. Um, we can navigate very quickly to the amended sections 
and it gives us a way to either go back and forth uh, from that section in our statute, um, or we can access the entire uh, statute uh, if we need to, if we need to navigate between codes and that sort of thing. Um, we've got additional tools for showing cross-references. This was probably the biggest um, uh, tool for us uh, in bill analysis anyway, because like I said, it, it allowed the, as the bills are filed, it's immediately uh, deposited into this system so we could get to work um, without even a request. We have to kind of front load our work because we have so few people doing so much. So we, uh, we actually, you know, began as soon as the bills are filed, we're beginning to look at them and, and start our analyses there. Um, I will say, uh, and when we're speaking of kind of limitations, for my part, I speak to the parliamentarians quite a bit about uh, potential points of order that are brought on the floor. And of course, everybody else in the Capitol, as you know, some people were mentioning, refer to page and line number, um, and that's not here. So I have to bounce between uh, a digital copy that has a page and line number and this tool, because this is kind of how I'm able to get to the information very easily uh, that, you know, to answer the questions. But in order to find where they're uh, asking about in the bill, I have to actually refer to that other document. So that's just one of those things that we haven't quite rectified in this system. Um, and then I will say also, I know that there's some other folks from, uh, from TLC, the Texas Legislative Council here from our legal editing group. And someone was speaking to the, the reading against with another person uh, and our uh, IS division developed a tool for doing that as well. So uh, they have a read against tool that helps them um, in that kind of proofreading aspect of, of their jobs and making sure that it syncs with, um, with uh, the current statute, which uh, again, this tool helps with respect to the analysis, but it's not not doing that same function. So there are other tools that our group doesn't use that are uh, used by uh, the legal editors and the proofreaders in our agency as well. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Fred. Well, uh, our uh, in-house tracking software is uh, substantially similar to what Texas is using. And so for uh, California, for our e-editing tools, I think the capability was always there. We just didn't use it. Uh, one example is we have a uh, comparison document tool and it was pretty much exclusively used by our editors. And then, uh, but when we went to the virtual environment, the attorney started using it for drafting in the office, we would just all go to the editor, editing staff said, could you run one for us? And now we're all just doing it ourselves. And so that's really freed up a lot of our editors time to focus on what they should really be doing, <laughs> reviewing the documents and not doing some work for the attorneys. Uh, but then also um, that uh, we have a, a history tracking system in our software. And so it really allows, uh, you know, our editors to have better communication with us that if uh, they've sent something back to one of my attorneys, I can turn around and see that there's a delay and say, well, what's going on? Maybe we need feedback from a client. Maybe they just forgot. And so I think just, you know, we've been using the tools we already have. And then in the, I noticed in the comments that uh, John from West Virginia, who I was able to meet, talked about, you know, doesn't it take more time to e-edit on the front end than paper. And I would, I would agree with that. I think it does. But I think the time we save from when it leaves our editors and our admin staff to get back to the client is substantially increased. So it might take a little bit more time between attorney and editor to flesh out some of these issues electronically, but to go from when everyone signed off on the language to getting back in our client's hands, which is probably the most important part of the job, that that saves so much time that it's worth the extra time that we're spending on the front end. Thanks. Okay, so <clears throat> panelists, we're coming down to our last question. How are you sustaining effective communication with your colleagues, not only for getting the work done, but for maintaining office morale? Lily. Meetings, meetings, meetings. <laughs> um, we have regularly scheduled meetings. I think I mentioned this before on all different days for all different kinds of groups. We are constantly going into a, a, a Google Meet uh, room We've even, some of them we've just established is the room we go to for this purpose or that purpose um, so that we can all see each other and talk. 
and look at documents. Um, we're uh, doing it in training right now where we're sharing. Um, um, one of the reasons I wanted to participate in this uh, was because when Wendy and I had talked, she was telling me about the Hive and ways that they were communicating. And th at the time, there were only three of us. We didn't have six yet. Um, but we weren't really talking very much at that point. Um, and we weren't having regular meetings. And um, I, 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 we weren't learning from each other. And we didn't have that collegial uh, collaboration that we were used to in the office. Um, I think one of the biggest things my editors miss is the candy that I used to always bring <laughs> so, in the office. <laughs> but um, uh, well, we just finally had to start doing meetings and sometimes it's just by phone um, and you know, we you know, um, get three and four people on the phone together. Um, all of our phones were forwarded. I think somebody mentioned that too from the office. So we are able to use the office phone numbers, um, which is nice instead of everybody's cell kind of being out in the wild. Um, and uh, and we and we really were just looking for ways. Any any suggestions you have? Um, I did want to respond to one of the the uh, comments too about why our IT people wanted to go away from Word, and that's because uh, Microsoft changes it all the time, and sometimes what they change affects our system, and we have to adapt to that. And over the years, it's it's um, it hasn't been as bad the last couple of um, versions um, of Microsoft. But it is, and I'm just going to use the technical term. Sometimes the word is wonky, and the technical people don't like that. So, but we love it, and we it really does give us an opportunity to uh, see all the edits, and we get to edit. Uh, we're giving a we're given a lot of trust uh, in Virginia because they let the editors actually put the edits in, and then they can remove them if they want to. And we put notes in about why we do it, and they can see our color, and um, we're not changing. We want to make sure we're not changing the law, obviously, um, but it's it's been very interesting um, in this process uh, when we don't have and we don't have access to the attorneys as easily either. Um, we're emailing and calling and um, doing some of the, those normal things, but um, any suggestions from the, the faculty um, or, um, or the people who are participating, um, I think we all can use more ways of communicating. Thanks, Wendy. Sure, thanks, Kay. So yes, I've talked about the Hive um, and it has been so helpful to use the Hive um, for collaboration when people have questions about grammar or syntax or statutory style, all manner of things that relate directly to work, we use that. Um, and then when it's appropriate, we do use it for chatting. Um, on the flip side of the coin, I will say that we've had to learn that the notifications can be incredibly distracting if you are trying to focus on an urgent task. And we've had to learn to be a little more assertive about saying, I'm changing my status to away or I'm going, I have to do this thing and I'm not responding. Um, so that's um, bringing on other ways to communicate um, but by and large, it's been super helpful and does mimic what we used to do in our editing room um, where we could just stop in someone's office to ask a question or to chat. Um, depending on your personality type, we do have introverts and extroverts. Um, and then I'll say something about something our bureau has done, our agency um, has been great for morale and it's called the water cooler. And there's a, a group of um, at least one editor and some attorneys and research analysts. They have been putting together, um, we had a Halloween get together. They have recipe exchanges. There's a book club going on. Um, there are some other things you can do too, but I think that that has, and it's all virtual of course, but I think that's helped with morale, um, particularly if you're a legislative staff who feels isolated at home and really misses the office environment. And then if you are a person who doesn't mind this, um, you don't have to engage with it. So I think um, it's worked out really well for, um, for our agency. Thanks. Carrie, how about your, your division? So we also are meeting a lot and a lot more than, than we ever did before. Um, we kind of, I, I, we have a lot of working meetings, of course, about specific projects. Um, and then for our uh, purposes, we usually have a project development meeting. So we talk about an incoming research request, for instance, 
Um, we're still doing those as our interim is winding down. Uh, then we meet throughout the project. We were using Slack uh, a lot uh, for, you know, kind of uh, just very quick uh, discussions about specific issues or that sort of thing. And then we, we jump on Slack calls a lot too. Um, and then we have a post-mortem meeting for every project, which just kind of runs us through what, you know, uh, happened, the highs and the lows and, and what we might need to learn from it uh, going forward. So we've got those working meetings happening um, for every project and, and we have, depending on your role in the group, you might be involved in three or four projects at a time. So that's keeping you quite connected to the group because it's, it's a rather small uh, group of researchers. Um, we also, uh, I used to manage the research, uh, the policy research group. And one of the things that I instituted when I was manager was um, biweekly one-on-ones with each member of staff. So those have continued uh, with um, the person who's now managing. And I think that those have been a, a big um, part of keeping morale up during uh, uh, this remote work, mainly because you can talk, it, the no topic is off the table. So it's not just about work and it just helps people kind of connect with what's going on. It's an easy way to, to check in and, and get the temperature of everyone and make sure that they're, you know, that they're doing well, that they're, they're uh, you know, emotionally and mentally uh, doing okay under the circumstances. Um, as far as Slack is concerned, we have a ton of channels. So we have a, a channel for each project that we have coming in. We have a pet picks channel we have a kid picks channel we've you know so we've got anybody can engage in um in any way that they want there there's a random channel which is very random so i think it's just a way to kind of keep uh messages coming in from people it takes uh, the place of some of that water cooler con kind of conversation that might have happened in the hallway um and uh, th then we've got groups that are doing uh you know uh, happy hours and trivia and that sort of stuff as well, which um, can be, you know, kind of a uh, saddle to work time to after work time. Uh, and again, people can kind of engage. Um, we are experimenting with we, we two things that we do in our agency and each division kind of has their own uh, version of it. We're very big uh, on Halloween here in Austin. So we tried to roll out a Halloween party a virtual Halloween party that didn't quite come together. I think though the Christmas party for the research division, we usually do a potluck. So we're trying to figure out a virtual potluck. I don't know exactly how that's gonna work, but hey, we might have potluck food picks too. So, you know, we'll see what happens. But, you know, I think we're just kind of constantly trying different things. We just recently started a newsletter for, uh, that's coming out once a month and, um, we're committed to, you know, just news about everybody in the agency. Um, in fact, the, the, the second edition just came out uh, last week and I, I was really struck. Like I said, I've been in the agency for a long time and I've been in research for almost 20 years now. Um, so I know a lot of things about people that others may not know. And I got a bunch of messages immediately. Oh, I had no idea. So I think it's great to kind of connect with people in that way and share information. Um, it seems to, to have really worked. Um, but again, I, I think everybody's got this kind of similar thing. We're meeting a lot more. I used to kind of have a rule that we only meet if there's something that's going to come out of it. And I've had to abandon that very quickly. So um, we're, we're just talking a lot. I will say real quickly, we, we did just adopt, um, we already had a way of doing, uh, connecting our phone uh, to our email. So we could at least get voicemail um, uh, through email, which was very helpful. Uh, if you happen to be away from your desk or something, you got an emergency uh, call. But now we've adopted Jabber, and I cannot say I just connected to it yesterday. But apparently, it's a program where you can connect your office phone to. We, we could forward our phones to our personal cells or something like that. But this is a way to actually connect to your um, to your direct line. So that's something that the agency has just adopted, and I haven't even gotten uh, fully connected on it. I tried one call yesterday for the first time, so. There are other tools that are emerging, you know, daily. Thanks. Fred, how about you? Well, I kind of went on the uh, other extreme. Uh, you know, we went home middle of March <laughs> and by October, I hadn't seen anyone on my team. So I got an idea, which uh, Raul Burciaga out in New Mexico called me crazy, but I had uh, office hours on my front lawn. 
And so as the kids say, picks or it didn't happen. So I'm gonna share with you my screen and uh, let's see, it doesn't wanna operate. There we go. It's been paused, but come on. Oh, did my system die here on me? Oh, this is, oh, here we go. There we go. So uh, I got out, uh, everything was connected to the power, so you power cord. I got snacks for everyone. We had socially distant chairs and masks. At one point, we might have had more people than the governor wanted on my lawn, but we were all six feet away, so it was good. And uh, that kind of uh, got um, uh, folks on my team thinking about doing it more. I've had another one of the attorneys host in their backyard, and it was just a way for us just to see each other face to face again. Uh, the fewer the people, the greater distance you can take off your mask and actually, you know, see someone smile and laugh and not see it all behind a mask. But it was great just to see everyone face to face, and that meant a lot to folks. And so I you know most parts of the country won't have California's uh, weather like we have in Sacramento, where you know we're getting into winter and you really can't do it. Uh, but you know, maybe in Montana, you could build snow people or something like that, but it was really good and everyone enjoyed it. And, uh, I would absolutely do it again in a heartbeat. Thank you, Fred. Yeah. Here at NCSL, we've done some similar things, um, to all of you. Um, uh, obviously we're using, uh, Microsoft teams quite a bit and we have, um, for our individual departments, we have teams channels, uh, we also have an internal newsletter and we've broadened that newsletter so that not only are we reporting on projects that we're working on, but if staff wanna put up photos of, of, um, of a hike they took or pictures of their dog or any of those kinds of things, they can add those as well. And so it's a way for us to, to feel connected in a new way. Um, so we're doing that and um, and we're also doing some of, of the um, things that Carrie was talking about, the idea of, of having some off-channel trivia games and that kind of thing to, to give us an opportunity to talk to one another. Um, so I know we're running over a little bit, but if anyone wants to share um, any information, um, if you're willing to raise your hand um, or if you have a question you'd like to ask our panel, um, I'm happy to keep our line open so that you can ask those questions and share your ideas now. Our audience is quiet. Uh, I wanted to share something. Perfect. Uh, so Wendy was talking about the stylus that uh, one of her coworkers recommended that, and that's what we've been using with Drawboard, and we've been using the diff the same colors we use for editing uh, with pencils and uh, rehewing, and it, it's worked really well. It it's it is like it feels close, very close to using a pencil, and you can write directly on the screen. Or you can also type the words in if you want. Um, we're, we're still learning a lot about how to use it, but um, it has been, I think it's been successful. And the stylus ha has really helped. <laughs> so I, I would recommend getting one if you, you can. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Um, so I've gotten a couple of questions in the chat. I'm just going to read aloud for the panel. Um, and if other people in the audience have ideas as well, please chime in. Um, Jeffrey asks, um, what are some approaches for training that you've found helpful? Um, so we've been training the last week um, with our seasonal proofers and we've been using Google Meet and I throw my screen up and I show all the things that I would have shown on a screen in an office. Um, we kind of figured it was very similar and I'm, um, I, Zoom and Google Meet could pretty much do the same thing on that. But um, most of the time it works effectively. They can see my mouse, I can move around, I can go, um, uh, go through the whole process um, of what we're doing. And um, they, we also have a manual. We did give them when they got their computer equipment. Um, we gave them our physical editing manual, um, which is actually two volumes now. 
it's gotten to two volumes. Um, that's kind of embarrassing, I think. <laughs> anyway, so um, we can just say turn to you know section twelve, and you know we start talking about that, and we have uh, they each have an electronic version of the manual, so they can search it, and it gives us that opportunity to um, you know uh, when we're not in meetings, we're telling them to you know read. Um, uh, comments from previous years, we give we show them where that is, so they can kind of see how it works, and then and then read their manual either online or physically um, in their book. And we have about two meetings a day, and um, in the uh, Google Meet, um, and it's it's been pretty efficient, I would say. Thank you, Lily. Um, anyone else on the panel with a comment on that, or I have more questions to offer you. I was just going to say real quickly, we are just about to begin our training. So we already had kind of, um, we were already set up pretty well for the training. We had small group training and kind of large group training and uh, asynchronous and synchronous uh, assignments and that sort of thing. So, um, but I am taking a cue from my daughter's experience where, you know, you have to kind of hit all of the things. So you need, you know, people are auto, uh, auditory learners and visual learners and that sort of thing. Uh, and we've been very careful in preparing in any way to kind of make sure we're, we're going to satisfy everyone's need in that regard, making sure, you know, some people seek a lot of feedback, some people don't. So I'm a little concerned about that being an impediment or the remote, you know, aspect of this being an impediment to those who would really like to get a lot of feedback and they might not seek it out. So we're trying to flip the script a little bit to where uh, our regular staff is going to check in periodically throughout the day as they're doing their asynchronous um, you know, work and that sort of thing. So they don't feel like they can't bother us. Uh, someone in, in our breakout room mentioned that, um, I think it was Richard who said something about how you don't realize when you're in an office environment that you, um, you can kind of tell who's too busy to bother and you, you know, might seek somebody else out if you are just looking for kind of general feedback. And I noted to him that I didn't realize it until he said that, but every single Slack message I, uh, if I don't already have an appointment with someone, every single Slack message I send starts with, are you available or can I bug you now or that sort of thing. It's not something that uh, I think was uh, normal, you know, in the office environment. So I think we're trying to be sensitive to those things that might come up uh, unexpectedly when we begin our, our training, especially with new staff. I mean, these are people who are just walking into the agency for the first time. Thanks. Um, Laura has a question. She asked, has anyone come up with a tandem proofreading method that has been effective? I can try to speak to that, Kay and Laura. Um, I did mention that we have been hopping on a call on Slack, or we also have access to WebEx to do tandem proofreading. Um, and as I said, we're still working on it. Like we have the piece about where one person is viewing the clean copy of whatever um, we edited. And then the other person is reading the changes that should have been implemented. But the piece about how, when you find something that didn't um, get implemented correctly, how are you making that change? Because in the past, we would just write it. We, the person who was looking at the clean copy would just simply mark it on the page and then another editor would implement that change. Um, so one thing I did try, and it feels uh, clunky, but I had the document open. Um, so as we were proofreading, whatever things were caught during tandem proofreading, I just made it on the fly. Um, and as an editor, we don't like to do anything on the fly. So I'm a little uncomfortable about that, um, but we're working on it. And I would love to hear if someone has a better idea. Audience members, do any of you want to contribute? Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and share some information with us if you have anything. Uh, I have, we've, we've been using a, a voice recorder and we just read to our, ourselves um, in those instances where we need to read against. Uh, so we, we just record it and that seems to work fairly well. Oh, interesting. So you read it aloud to yourself uh, and then play it back to listen to it. Yeah, we, we have the read against tool that Carrie mentioned for most of our work, but there are some things we still have to read out loud. And that, so we've been doing that some, uh, especially for things where you don't have to do a lot of reading against. 
So that's, that's, that's worked pretty well. That's a great idea. And um, one thing that occurred to me at home, I'm in my office now, but maybe I could get one of my sons to read this to me, but then that's breaking confidentiality. So <laughs> that's not helpful. Thanks for offering that idea, Claire. I'm gonna look into that. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else have anything they'd like to contribute? All right. Um, well, we've come to the end of our session. We really appreciate all of the input. Um, I really wanna thank our panel, um, Lily and Wendy and Carrie and Fred. They spent a lot of time preparing for this. Um, they put a lot of thought into what they would have wanted to know if they were on the other side of this, um, because obviously they wanted to make sure they were sharing information with all of you that would be helpful. Um, we also really appreciate all of the questions that, that have been posted and the comments that were posted in the chat. And I promise that I will send those out to you as well as um, the booklet that, uh, that Wendy has put together. I'll send those out as a handout to you. Um, if you have future sessions that you'd like for NCSL to consider um, producing for um, legislative staff, please let me know. I am available anytime you have questions um, and I welcome your input. Um, thank you so much for spending your time with us and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks.